So Garrett says the two law, the TLDR of my question is, and too long, don't read for those that don't know what that acronym is. Is there any documentation or what's the bro science on crank length with road cycling? Chad's going to go deep onto this one. Um, but I'm going to read his scenario first. Is that okay, Chad? Yep. Yep. Cool. He says I'm six foot five inches and a fitter recommended I should run 172.5 millimeter crank length. I've been running it for 10,000 miles over two years. And then I got a new bike with 175 millimeter crank length because I'm six, five and lots of people much smaller than me are running 175 millimeter crank length. And now I'm experiencing a ton of pain in my hip flexors, quads, hamstrings, and knees. I'm listening to the podcast. Like it's my job. And I love what you guys are doing. I've learned so much more over the last few weeks listening in comparison to what I was getting from a coach over a six month period. I'm trying to figure out how to make the cut over from training peaks to trainer road now. So expect a new customer shortly. Good to hear Garrett crank length. And I want to point out one thing before you get into this, Chad, <laughs> Chad's prepping himself over there. I got, I got 20 <laughs> minutes to get through this. Come on. We can do it. <laughs> one thing that we need to mention with this though, is the fact that many times we see a mechanical change in our setup or something like that. And then we experience some level of discomfort <clears throat> and at the risk of mis misattribution, we just assign whatever that change is to the discomfort. Right? So I've done this plenty of times where I've been like that my cleat moved and now my life is over. Like everything is dead, <laughs> but it's, it's likely from other things as well. So what I'm saying here, and I just want to get into this in this specific situation for Garrett coming in, Garrett, I know that you're experiencing a ton of pain in your hip flexors, quads, hamstrings, and knees, and that could totally be from your crank length, but it also could be from many other things as well. So with that said, I think that we should jump in. That probably sets the tone for this conversation about crank length, but Chad, uh, you start in wherever you feel like we should start in on this. Okay. So I'm going to restate Garrett's uh, TLDR. Is there any documentation or what's the bro science on crank length with road cycling? Okay, so I'm going to start with as close as I can get to bro science. And, and it's basically an explanation of my explanation of why I think we've come to believe that longer cranks translate to more power. I think it stems from the extremes of crank length specificity. And, and it's caused us to form these misguided understandings in quotes. That, that longer cranks translate to greater leverage, not much is true, automatically translates to greater power. That may or may not be true, probably not. So two examples of why we may think this, I think are BMXers, who when you consider a BMXer launching out of the start gates, we're talking five to six seconds, upwards of 200 RPM. Some of them touch 220, even a little higher than that and generate 2000 plus Watts over that short span of time, as high as 2,400 Watts, maybe even a little higher than that. So when you're pushing the upper bounds of what you can do in terms of your cadence, every extra millimeter on a fixed gear of crank length matters. Mm -hmm. This is true. This, this, this holds up tracks kind of, kind of the same way track sprints face similar fixed gear limitations and longer cranks in some cases are actually beneficial. Think of the match sprint or the, the team sprint or chariot races, if they still do those, which are basically standing start, uh, I think two laps. I mean, it's a drag race. Again, those millimeters do matter and they can't change many other things about the bike. They can choose their gearing, but that's gearing that they're married to for the course of that event. So ostensibly this is, this looks like longer cranks do yield bigger Watts and the highest speeds but these are fixed gear scenarios and it doesn't even apply to all fixed gear scenarios. Bikes with gears, however, just know the literature isn't there. So <clears throat> I think with crank length, that comes down to two primary concerns. One is that of power maximization and the other is that of comfort. And both those things definitely lead toward performance. I mean, they, they definitely impact performance. And with power, I think the idea is that Shorter cranks can cost me power. Longer cranks can at least create the opportunity for more power. You still got to be able to muscle those big cranks, but the opportunities there, mm. not so much, at least not as far as the scientific literature goes. Let's look as far back as 1983 in bar and colleagues used students, mind you students, and they did 30 second seated efforts and they used crank lengths in 25 millimeter increments all the way from 125 up to 225. And they found no significant change in either peak power or maximal power over that 30 peak uh, maximal power over that 30 seconds between the 150s and the 200s. And they only saw a small decline of two to 5% when they went to the extremes, the 125s to the 225. So when they went very short and very long, there was only a minor decrease. But again, those are extremes. 150 to 200 millimeters covers a lot of ground. 
Flash forward 2001, Martin and Spredoso, they looked at op they looked at a number of things, but one of them was optimal crank length to leg length ratio for maximal power production. And in this case, they only went for three or four seconds, but they used trained subjects. And they looked at 120, 145, 170, 195, and 220. So a similar, similar design in that respect. And for what it's worth, the 170 seemed to be the sweet spot. And there it is again for, for most of the riders. Between the extremes, 120 to 220, and we're talking an 83% variance in crank length. That's, that's enormous. There was about a 4% decline. So again, they had to go to the extremes. And even then, the power decline was minimal. Also, those 170s that I mentioned accommodated the shortest and the longest legged riders to the point where the greatest sacrifice in power output they saw was less than 0.5%, less than half a percent. And for shortest and long legged, to put that in context, we're talking the shortest was 76, longest was 92 centimeters, which translates in inches to 30 to 36. So that's a pretty big difference, 30 inch inseam to 36. Mm -hmm. Then forward a little farther, Barrett and, and Martin. So Martin was in the previous study. This time he's the, he's the principal. 2011, 15 train cyclists. They determined that crank length doesn't affect joint specific power, at, not at the hip, not at the knee, not at the ankle. Once effects of pedaling rate and speed are accounted for. And this is important because we're, we're talking about power here. Now, now let's take a look at efficiency. Morris and Laundry in 1997. This is a study I see cited a lot. See, uh, they use six competitive cyclists. They had them ride for an hour and 45 at 65% of VO2 max. So not a hard ride, but a long-ish long, long -ish ride, enough to inspire some fatigue. And they found that changing crank length between five and 10 millimeters increased the oxygen consumption up to 11%. So, you know, the takeaway here is, oh my God, it tanks your efficiency, but they limited their riders to 90 RPM only. So they would change the crank lengths, but they wouldn't let, allow them to change the RP or RPM to suit. Two weeks ago, if you've, you harken back, we covered cadence has a measurable impact on oxygen uptake or efficiency. Had they allowed the cadence to be matched to the crank length, probably would not have seen this. We would have th seen things more in line with Astrand way back in 1953, McDaniel 2002, Farrah Roca 2017, who all showed no effect on oxygen consumption, aka efficiency. Mm -hmm. So the take home thus far is that this idea of optimization of crank length is irrelevant to speed, power, and efficiency. So maybe you ask, what about race performance? Let's look at mountain bike riders. McDermott and Edwards, 2009, all these studies are linked, took seven competitive female cross-country riders. They had them use 170s, 172.5, and 175. I mean, that basically covers what is issued on every bike that comes out of a factory these days, right? I don't, I don't see different crank lengths standard. The only differences in this study were time to reach super maximal power. So the 170s, and keep that number in mind because it's going to come back, over the 175s yielded 27.8% performance advantage. And I think this is crazy relevant in that these quick response times are very important in certain situations. And mountain biking is one of them where you have to deal with constant changes in terrain. If you're racing, you're responding and maybe even initiating attacks, which makes it super road applicable too. And track applicable. If we look at <clears throat> Bradley Wiggins and the, the whole of team GP, GB, Great Britain in the, in the team pursuit in what was that Rio just four years ago, right? Or yeah, about four years ago, they did it on 165s. <laughs> These are some lanky fellas. The women, did it on 160s and they reset the Olympic record and the world record each round until they took home gold and reset that record once more on 160s. That's, That's an interesting point with that. Like, I, I feel like with the uh, mountain biking in particular, I've noticed this, but I notice it in a different way when I'm riding and I'm split stanced feet are parallel and I'm descending. And this is probably something, and this is a good point with crank length, right? Chad, in the sense that if the crank length changes, your body also does adapt. It's not like your body is a fixed mechanism stuck upon a bicycle in the sense that like, you know, your body moves around things. And that's where like the leverage thing is always tricky to me because it's kind of like, well, yeah, well, the body is going to change the way it works and it has that ability to be able to do it. It's plastic. But I've noticed that when I go to, cause I like running one seventies when I go to one seventy fives or anything else like that, I noticed that it, it really feel, I feel like a fish out of water when I'm descending with one foot in front of the other. 
because of that increased distance, it's a small thing, but my legs are further spread apart and it's very strange and awkward. So there's, there's also that aspect of it too, which is a whole lot tougher to measure in a study, but, um, the stance and position that you have when you're descending uh, for mountain biking in particular can, mm. it can absolutely have an effect. I didn't consider that. Yeah. 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 Uh, why well, I want to mention one thing about time priling and shorter crank length is there is, it can change your position a bunch. Okay. So wait. if you, if I can yeah. cut you off, I'm actually going to cover that all in, in, in depth just now. Got it. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, was, I did see Amber. Sheet, so I thought I should read. <laughs> it's, I see some purple and pink here. So I don't know if you guys want to, I, I know Nate, your comment, but okay, cool. So thus far we've covered speed, power, efficiency, and race performance, but what of aerodynamics? So shorter cranks accommodate aero positions better. Again, full stop. That, that that's simply how it that, that's simply how it goes because they accommodate greater hip angle. They allow you to open up the hips a little more. So if we talk about Bradley Wiggins again, I know we're talking about the extreme situation here, but in his World Hour record pursuit or World Hour record attempt, he initially started training at one with one seventy seven fives. So he was of the whole old school long crank thought, transitioned down to one seventies. In doing so. He dropped his front end 30 millimeters and accumulated 3.5% improvement in his aerodynamics. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this is attributed to Phil Burt. And there's a little YouTube clip that, that is linked. Phil worked for 12 years as the head physiotherapist at British Cycling. He worked for five years as a consulting physiotherapist for Sky or Enios. He is a highly knowledgeable advocate for shorter cranks. And he points out several things. One of which is that a smaller radius creates a smaller, a smaller hole in the air. There's an arrow advantage, number one. Even a slight clank, cr crank length reduction can drastically impact your thigh torso relationship to the point where every 2.5 millimeter drop is roughly 1.5 to two degrees backwards tip of your torso. Again, your hip range grows. And what happens when your hip range grows is a number of things. First, your diaphragm can drop, so your breathing capacity improves. Pretty important with an aerobic sport. You stop chewing your knees or, or as, as Phil Burt puts it, or, you know, hitting your elbow pads or hitting your elbows themselves. Mm -hmm. He also points out that he has never, not one time had a reason to go bigger. Mm -hmm. So if he changes anything, he goes slow, so he goes smaller. So all of this affords us quite a lot of flexibility in crank length selection. So why don't we chase comfort? And in doing mm -hmm. so, or as part and parcel chase improved joint health. So Jim Martin, who's a PhD and researcher out of University of Utah, points out that if, you know, riders between five foot eight and five foot 10, sorry, I didn't translate to that centimeters, simply can't get horizontal with crank lengths of 170 to 175. And this is a pretty standard issue again. And being shorter actually compounds this, makes it even tougher. He also points out that if you're in the middle of the height bell curve, and in the United States, that's about 5'9 to 5'4, so 175 centimeters down to 163, that a 165 to 175 range will probably accommodate you. But that doesn't account for torso length and leg length peculiarities. What if you're particularly long limbed, but your torso is short? What if you're just the opposite? You got a long torso, short limbs. On top of that, what if you have any asymmetries? These are far more easily balanced out if you go shorter. Longer simply or typically compounds the issue. Saddle pain is one of these. Saddle pain due to reaching and rocking. Two long cranks, the saddle set where you want it to be. I mean, that, that rocking can create issues in a hurry. Struggles with quicker cadences. Sometimes you think, I'm just, I just can't spin quickly. Well, maybe your cranks are too long. And then Garrett, what about joint issues? So even a five millimeter reduction significantly decreases the, the necessary range of motion. And what goes along with that is the loading range. You know, how, where, where in that circumference are you actually driving downward? The translation is that it lessens the kinematic load. Translated further, it lessens the wear and tear. So Bert, or uh, was it Phil Bert, liken this to box jumps. He's like, if you had to jump onto a box a hundred times, are you going to jump onto a higher box or a lower box? If you're trying to minimize wear and tear, obviously you're going to choose the lower one. And then one of these fellas ha had a power analogy where they're talking about power creation. He's like, if you were to load up a squat bar, how much you put a heavy bar, it's going to be a heck of a lot easier to move if you narrow your range rather than grow your range. So shorter range moves more weight. Shorter range is more powerful is, is, is the logic there. Yeah. Amber, you want to say something? 
or is that I was just going to say, yeah, early in my career, um, I was advised to run 175s because I'm 5'10", I'm a larger writer. Um, and the thinking at that point was, you know, I'm capable of producing that torque, therefore I'm capable of taking advantage of that and, and that that would give some kind of an advantage. And then later in my career, I ended up with a knee injury <clears throat> and it was through rehabbing that knee injury that I realized I had some asymmetry, more asymmetry in my leg length than I thought, I think it's mm -hmm. over a centimeter. Um, but I ended up going back down to 172 fives and that made a huge difference in my comfort. And then, um, I also dropped to 170 on my TT bike specifically because I have a, I'm, I'm have a big torso and like a big lung capacity and <laughs> rib cage. So I was definitely having problems with my hitting my knees. Like my knees just mm -hmm. would come up and hit me, especially That's when I'm trying to belly concern. breathe on the, yeah, on the TT bike and dropping down to one seventies on the TT bike made a huge difference. And to be honest, when I would switch between bikes, so I had 172.5 on my road bike and 170 on my TT bike, I didn't really feel a difference. Um, like uh, I'm not a I'm not a Jonathan on, <laughs> on that front, <laughs> but but, um, but it was it was really easy to adapt between the two setups for me, and I and I do think that um, decreasing the crank length was really beneficial for my my comfort and specifically for my knee. That's perfect because it lines up with what what is the take home advice consensus here is that both Bert and Martin advise that if you're in doubt, go 2.5, even five millimeters shorter. Start there. Yeah. Um, and this is backed up by a, a study I referenced earlier, that Ferro Roca 2017. They agree wholeheartedly. I agree as well with a, a single caveat in that this needs to be dis discussed with a bike fitter. And I think this is what Nate's going to talk about because when you change your crank length, you're probably going to need to change your saddle height. Anytime you change your saddle height, you're going to affect your reach. You're probably going to need to change your fore aft. You're probably going to, you're at least going to affect your stack height. If you don't change it, all of these things affect your center of gravity, all of which influences your bike handling. So you do have to recognize that if you change one cog in this machine, the machine is going to behave a little differently. And I think if you recruit a certified expert to steer you along this course, you'll be better, better off. Yeah. So everything changes. If your cranks go, so I switched from 175 to 165 in triathlon one year. And that means that I would had to raise my saddle height by 10 millimeters, right? Because, uh, I'm, my leg is going 10 millimeters less down to the bottom of the crank. And, but if, because my front end did not change, uh, my drop was bigger, but the other part that is nice is at the top of your pedal stroke, your knee isn't, is 10 millimeters lower. So therefore you are not, uh, closing off your hip angle, which for me, I get a, like a 10% power reduction on a TT bike with 175s. Uh, if I'm, if my low end, if my hip angle is too cut off. So if you're going to do this for 165, you're going to want to think if you want to improve your hip angle, you're going to want to raise your front end too at the same time. And you can maintain the same like aerodynamic posture as your body, but open up your hip angle, thus hopefully getting more power in the same arrow here. What Wiggins did is I think Wiggins, he, uh, he went to smaller cranks and then also kept the front end lower, lowered it, thus increasing aerodynamics. And I'm sure he was thoroughly tested about power in different positions and aerodynamics and did all the math inside of that. Uh, I think when we do triathlon, I might try just in the very beginning, 170s, because their 165s are hard to come by, at least they were back in the day, but 170s, you can get them and just see if uh, how my power output is and see if I get that same 10% drop. I can do a ramp test on my road bike, then a ramp test on the TT bike with 170s after I do a couple weeks of um, adaptation to it and uh, or adaption to it. I don't know what the right word is. See, you don't have to be perfect at everything, people. You need to speak English. Uh, don't worry about it. Um, and then, yeah, and then see what happens because if I can put out more power, if I can put out my road power on my TT bike, I'm going to smoke you fools. Like, not even close. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sorry, wow. fools. That's bold. That it's just bold. fun to say. That it is bold. fun to say. Someone said I'm the protagonist and the antagonist at the same time <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> Which that's is true. true. That is, that's funny. Yeah, that's but I true. want to be able to get, that would be, I mean, honestly though, if I could do a lot of power on the TT bike, I would have a good advantage. But as of now, I cannot. And I think Amber, can you do, do you really know, can you do similar power on the TT bike and the road bike? Yeah, it's about the same. Yeah, that's, that's troubling. Dang. Chad, you can. <laughs> That's right? troubling. <laughs> uh, John, you can't though. You put out less power, right? Yeah, significantly less. But then again, my position is probably going to change a whole lot doing triathlon. Yeah. So 
I might be more capable because my current one is very constrained. If you want to see my arrow position, go to my Instagram. You you have a world class CDA. I think you can, uh, especially for comfort on an Ironman, you can kind of uh, go up a little bit higher. Probably still more flexibility than us. Yeah. have some wiggle room to, to, to explore with that. Yeah. It, I, I use one seventies. And to be honest, I'd be happy using a lot shorter cranks, but to your point, Nate, they're really hard to find. Like for mountain biking, for example, it's really hard to find one sixty five millimeter downhill or cranks that aren't downhill cranks. Like it's more common to find really heavy duty, big downhill cranks that are shorter, but it's harder to find light cranks that are just similarly light to what you would find for a high end crank set. That's going to be shorter. So and, and, and I, with mountain biking, it's funny because we talk about pedal strikes a lot. And I know that your thought is, well, when you go from 175 to 175 millimeters really isn't that much of a difference. And I know it's not, but it's a, the thing is we, we build a very impressive amount of like proprioception with our body and our bike, like the awareness of where everything is. And when you change that initially, you'll pedal strike quite a lot when you go to longer cranks and it will feel really weird. But in addition to that, it, it only takes many times what you're riding. And, and honestly, a lot of trail builders even will like build trails with the thought of, no, that looks too high. That'll hit someone's pedal. Right. So like we come across all these scenarios where we're pretty close to the line anyway. So instead of arguing about five millimeters, isn't it just better to have more clearance? And really the other way to look at it too, is a lot of the time it's less about you hitting the cranks more often. Let's say now you're going to hit them 32 times instead of 20, whatever it is. Instead, it's only about hitting your cranks once. I don't know if anybody else feels this, but once I get one pedal strike, I'm terrified of getting more pedal strikes thereafter. So then what it does is it makes me go into sections with more hesitation. I'm more eager to jump off the bike rather than stay on the bike and try to make it through. It really just erodes confidence a lot of the time. So it's, it's a pedal strike in itself. It actually has cascading effects that can affect your riding more than just the fact that you bumped your pedal on the ground. It can really affect the psychology of the rider. So at tell you ride, I, uh, so the, the new Epic sits lower than pivot with, uh, the live valve. So live valve, like really kept me high, uh, in certain situations and the pivot definitely sits lower, has a lower bottom bracket. And I'm still not. Yeah. The epic, sorry, I am still not used to that. At Telluride, I, uh, I, on some kind of flatter descent, I pedaled where I shouldn't have, hit my cleat, crashed, hit my head on a rock, uh, but the helmet hit, so that was good. And then at Shenandoah or Shannon, I don't know how to say it, but the that one, I hit my other pedal so hard that it blew up the bottom of it, and I like I, got, I couldn't get in, and then it spun around. I got on the other side. It was uh, SPDs, but that could have been a race ender, right? By blowing up the I mean, I blew up my pedal and I blew up my shoe, uh, mm-hmm. cause I think that caused me to crash also at the same time. So pedal mm-hmm. strikes are real and pedal strike crashes are horrible because it's just yeah, like just somebody grabbing your bike and like throwing you. It's like high siding. Ain't uh, no crash like a pedal strike crash. They're the absolute worst. <laughs> it's so bad. Well, there's, there's some <laughs> other bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Good point, Nate. Uh, even on road, right? Like it, it helps a lot to build that, like. It's amazing when you look at pictures of a really good crit racer or road racer, and you'll see them pedal through a turn. If you can never do slow-mo or get like a high res picture of it, it's amazing. They've got like, like, it'd be really tough to fit like a stack of like, you can't fit a stack of post-it notes. We're talking a few post-it notes underneath that in between their pedal and the ground. You really build that level of precision and one pedal stroke in or out of a corner, Amber can mean like everything, right? Um, So it totally changes things. So. Oh, big time. Yeah. And even sometimes pedal striking without having it disrupt anything, it disrupts your focus so much. It can really throw you off for a while. Yeah. Like when there's a rider that pedal strikes in a group and you're in a group ride or a race or anything oh, else like that, like it's like a cascade through the rest of the group. Everyone's like, Oh, Oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Uh, Sassoon, su- 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 I did the Sassoon su- crit and I watch other people almost every single race somebody crashed because it's um it's a very slight curved um convex mm. uh road and i i was actually okay. going in a breakaway i was attacking and i hit my pedals so hard this bang <laughs> happens my rear wheel skips oh so it was the opposite for me i got an adrenaline shot and everyone behind me goes whoa let that guy <laughs> <laughs> it was like a drop in a banana in mario kart yeah. let that guy go <laughs> Like, just, we don't really, let's give him a little bit of space. 
<laughs> Hopefully he tires out because we don't need to be on that. But, but every time after that, I did not pedal on that corner ever again. Uh, but it's, that's a, that's a small pro tip is if you can watch a race ahead of time and mm -hmm. see where people crash, like if, if ev this is probably the, the most crashes I've seen in a race, if everybody crashes in the same section, there's a reason for that <laughs> and try to figure out what that reason is. Uh, yeah. that I don't think people do that enough. They just, you know, they don't watch the previous races. Mm -hmm. Even where attacks happen, that can help it. you too. Yeah. You can see where attacks happen. You can see, you can watch people taking different lines to the corner and see which line is the fastest. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, it's really, really helpful. Yeah. How the finish is like if every oh. race before you is always a bunch sprint, it's probably going to be a bunch sprint unless there's your a totally different fitness level in your category. But if they're mm -hmm. all breakaways or something, it's probably a breakaway course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's even helpful. Sorry. I know that this is a bit off track, but, uh, on, <laughs> from the crank length thing, but I think that we've We've done that one, sealed that one up. Um, but even watching the races, if it's a criterium and you're there watching the races beforehand with grains of salt handy, knowing that they're different fitness levels and everything else. But for example, a course where it's usually like, it's always a sprint, something like that. But if it's a break, if it's a super windy day, it might change things. Right. Or maybe there's a, a thing where they change the pavement in a spot. Who knows? I could, I, I mean, Amber's used to that with all the European races, changing things unexpectedly at the last moment, I'm sure. But yeah, the wind is an important one. You can watch how the, the Peloton is, is adjusting and how people are moving across the road. And that can give you some really good clues, uh, for wind direction, or even you can see the wind direction if you look at a flag, but you might not know where and how people are feeling it on the course. But if you watch mm -hmm. how people move on the course, it makes it very, very clear. It's like building and stuff, right? On these, these city crits of, mm -hmm. of a certain spot, like the wind suddenly comes through and then everyone echelons out and you, that's cool. Yeah. If you're on the right yeah, side, yeah. it's nice. Or the yes. correct <laughs> side. Yeah. If you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, you can give it a thumbs down, but let us know what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, check out trainerroad.com. Do it. If you think I have better hair than Jonathan, give it a thumbs up. If not, leave a comment. My hair is better than his.